Okay, here we are, uh, Lecture 10, The English Church Reformed. I started this lecture last week, and I want to go back and review it a little bit to, uh, to refresh our memory about what I talked about last time and, and just very briefly go over it quickly. Um, I see that we've got our off-campus students there. We have uh, uh, Fort Bend, is it? Yes, ma'am. Fort Bend, that's Christopher at Fort Bend? Yes, it is. Right, good. Hello. And then our, our other person is where? The Woodlands. Woodlands, right. Okay, good. We're glad you're there. Um, I wasn't able to get a hold of my, my uh, final, or uh, I mean my midterm stuff. Your midterm exam? I, I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't get on that website, and I couldn't get a hold of anyone on the helpline. I, I let the phone ring for like an hour. Wow, okay. Uh, keep trying. You haven't gotten on the website at all yet? Well, um, when I was trying to get on from this school, uh -huh. I was not able to get onto anything. But when I tried from my home, I got onto the web page, but... Um, it had some instead of the icons it had little blocks i don't know if you've ever if you've ever experienced that but it's the graphics are different for different systems and it didn't work for that particular computer uh, so I was not able to access All right. It. We have a solution. Uh, if you will email our TA tonight, email our TA Joni and she will email the exam to you. Okay? Now, in future years, when we do this class, we hope this won't happen. But, but this year, when we're videotaping, do I have her? Do I have her email, or his email? I'm not sure. It's on the syllabus. Oh, it is. It's on the syllabus. Okay, I'll, I'll email her tonight. Right. Thank we you very much. Good. We always put the TA's email address and my email address on the syllabus so that you can you can email whenever you have this kind of a problem. You can email. Okay. Um, we are speaking of the syllabus. We are a little bit off schedule, and so what I'm what I'm planning <laughs> to do is talk about the Norman Church, the Anglo-Norman Church tonight, and how the, the, the Norman Church was in Normandy and how it reformed the English Church, how the Normans reformed the English Church. And then next week, I want to talk about the Sons of the Conqueror. And so what we'll do is next week, we're going to finish up everything to do with Normandy and England and the Normans in Normandy and England. Okay, and then uh, after spring break, the week after spring break, we will move to Norman Italy and Sicily and start working on that area of the world. So, so that's the, the general plan. Uh, so I'm hoping that we'll have some discussion tonight as we talk about the Norman Church. And perhaps you've had time to reflect a little bit on what I said last week. Here is the Norman Church reformed. And I raised the question of um, whether we can speak of England as being colonized in, in the modern way that we speak of colonial powers taking over another country. Is that a good comparison to make for the Normans conquering England and the creation of the Anglo-Norman state? Is there such a thing as the Anglo-Norman state? And I showed you some pictures again of Anglo-Norman ships taking, taken from Anglo-Norman manuscripts. And here, of course, is a battle from an Anglo-Norman manuscript. And here are warriors, uh, which I've already shown you. Uh, this is the Wheel of Fortune, which is something, a concept that the Anglo-Normans were very much aware of, thinking about how easily they had uh, conquered England. And, and they, they sort of trumpeted their propaganda that they did it in one battle. But remember, under William the Conqueror, you had attack after attack after attack from, from rival claimants to the throne. And so they were quite aware of how tenuous their situation was, and they were determined to hold it down. Well, the English customs adopted by the Conqueror, I went through all the, all the various customs and, and William the Conqueror's um, determination to return to the laws of his predecessor. And in fact, there's a wonderful book out by Bruce O'Brien on the laws of Edward the Confessor. And I don't think I have a pen here to 
right, Bruce O'Brien, but um, it, it's on the laws of Edward the Confessor, and they were actually written down by the Normans in an attempt to determine what were the customs of the Anglo-Norman kingdom in order for William to conquer them and, and uh, to, to, to carry them out. And so then uh, we talked about all of those various customs. Here is um, the feudal monarchy, the imposition of feudal institutions over Anglo-Scandinavian institutions. And uh, I mentioned also that Richard Abels wrote a book um, called, uh, I think, uh, kings and thanes in Anglo-Saxon England or something of, of that sort where he he constructed a picture of the relationship between the th the thanes and the kings that was almost like feudalism uh, in Normandy without ever using the word and so he, this was a major revision of, of um, uh, historical theory um, there William the Conqueror, when he took over, altered this though by imposing a imposing Norman customs on top of the Anglo-Saxon customs, and so I drew lines the parallels that there were uh, the similarity between the bookland, which were lands that were held um, under the uh, Anglo-Saxons, with the land grants of, of holdings in tenure throughout England. Do you all understand that concept of holding in tenure? When I, when I say, no, okay, good. When I say that William the Conqueror went throughout England and granted lands wherever he went to his followers who were in his army at that time, I'm talking about the granting of tenure. The theory is that the king owned all the land in England and that his followers or his his either his magnates or his vassals would hold that land in tenure at the king's pleasure and if they committed treason or if they did anything uh, against the king uh, he could take that land back and when he when they died when the vassals die the lands revert to the kings and so the theory is that the king holds all the land in England and that he has the power to grant it, the use of that land to his vassals, yeah. Even the land that belongs to the churches is uh, the king's land? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> yes, the theory is the land that belongs to the church is the king's land to grant, but we have counterforces operating in, in England, uh, forces that are at work in the reform papacy that have been at work since 1049, that are beginning to claim that all grants to the church are in perpetuity and forever. So this works against the tenure system, uh, the idea that um, holding lands in, ten in, in tenancy or in tenure um, uh, only works for laymen and not for churchmen. The church is claiming that it has its lands in perpetuity. And, and so, uh, this is something that is changing just at this very time, though, because before uh, the Norman Conquest and before 1049, church lands were just as vulnerable to being seized by uh, laymen as, as ordinary lands were. So this is a time of transition, moving from one system to another. We also talked about the Council of Barons, which is Norman, uh, that, that William the Conqueror had a council around him of, of, of knights and magnates. And, and we really only talk about magnates when we get to England. They're not magnates in Normandy. They're more, his, uh, more like a bodyguard or a group of supporters in Normandy because they're not really necessarily the largest landholders. In England, these Norman institutions get changed, they get modified, and so the group around the king are the magnates, the great landholders, because they're being rewarded and they're the king's faithful men. And, and the king sometimes <laughs> raises people from the dust. He will raise them from the dust, so to speak, men who are poor and owe all their wealth to the king. And so we see that beginning in England after the conquest. The earls and sheriffs in England are comparable to the Comes and Vicky Comes in, uh, in Normandy, although he was careful, William was careful not to make anyone man too powerful. 
and here are here is the king at his court and dealing with his courtiers in various ways. Uh, I, I listed the um, the people who uh, had gone from Normandy to England, and this is something that is really, really interesting that, that nobody has written very much about, um, th this idea. Odo, who was Bishop of Bayou in Normandy, was Earl of Kent in England. And does that seem to you like something that is kind of contradictory, that, that someone who's a bishop in Normandy can be an earl in England? Because an earl, by definition, is a guardian of, of, the, of the coast. And an earl is a secular office. Um, in Normandy, there were often cases of that be, before the Norman conquest where, uh, for example, there was a bish the Bishop of Evreux was also the Count of Evreux, if I'm remembering correctly. And, and um, so you would see those double offices, but people like Lanfranc in Normandy were working against that and trying to separate the church from secular duties. But William was not totally in tune with that because look what he did. He, and, and Geoffrey Bishop of Coutances became one of the greatest judges in England. Yeah, question. I'm wondering if William had a shortage of people that he could trust initially and that may be why he limited the number of people that he worked with. Uh, yes, I think that's that's certainly true, and there were a lot of rebels who were exiled. Uh, anybody who rebelled against him was usually, their lands were confiscated and they were sent into exile. And so there were often cases of that kind. Yeah, Jason. Uh, being the Earl no, of Kent, Jason. that gave him an income in England that he could use then to support himself in England. I don't know that it's really any different than later period in France where you had Cardinal Richelieu or other cardinals as their prime minister, or you even had Cardinal Wolsey as prime minister in England under Henry VIII. Uh, no, it's, it's not that different um, a system, but there's a lot of time in between those two events. I mean, there's a lot of evolution going on in there. And, and, you know, even 50 years can make a real difference and the system can shift in major ways. So uh, the comparison can be made, but it can only be a loose comparison uh, of how the church participated in government. And churchmen always demanded to participate in government. I mean, they, especially in England, this is true. Uh, uh, it wasn't true in early Normandy, of course. Uh, Lanfranc had to pretty much force his way in to be the advisor to the king. I take it the earldom was not made hereditary, but simply a lifetime. In, in the time of William the Conqueror, he made it very clear that the earldoms were not hereditary. As the next generation came uh, about, though, they became hereditary. The tendencies were for them to become more and more hereditary. And by the time two generations had passed, people expected their lands to be hereditary and their holding of the land. So uh, it's almost as if the feudal system breaks down before it even gets started uh, in England. And, and this is one of the difficulties with labeling it the feudal system because it, it doesn't, it's changing constantly under different conditions. So feudalism is a very slippery kind of thing. And we also mentioned that all of these earls he created were marcher earls, defenders of the coasts and the borders. And I tried to outline for you where these earldoms were. Here is Kent, uh, there, uh, Kent here and Hereford, Chester and Shrewsbury lined up along this border with Wales to protect the borders, Northumbria and uh, Richmond along this border. And then we have some in here that are really along the borders of the Dana Law to protect against the Dana Law. Yeah. I, I, I'm a little confused on that former page. Actually, two pages back, it said okay. no no counts became Earl. Yeah. But on the next page, it says Robert Count of Mulan, Earl of Leicester. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I'm glad you... Uh, this is Robert of Beaumont, who, who was also Count of Moulin and also Earl of Leicester. Uh, uh, Robert of Beaumont was the son of Roger of Beaumont, as was Henry of Beaumont, and Roger of Beaumont was, was sort of a, one of the grand advisors to William in Normandy, and Robert 
fought in the Battle of Hastings. Uh, he was Count of Moulin, which was a he was a French Count. Moulin is on the on the um, borders of Paris. And so uh, he was actually a French count and not a Norman count. So he wasn't a count in Normandy. He was a count in France. And he became Earl of Leicester. And, and he was actually one of the key men uh, in William Rufus's reign because of his power over the King of France because he held the county of Moulin. And this is, uh, he's a really interesting guy. Uh, but thanks for noting that, okay. All right, and here we have, here's the plan of Chester, which was uh, virtually a city that was founded by the Normans with the Norman castle. Here's the castle right here, and so the town is kind of built around it. And this is the origin of many of the towns in Normandy and in England. When, when William built these castles, whether they were in Normandy or in England, inevitably towns grew up around them. And so the, these are the beginnings of many of the towns. And so you can see this town sort of growing up here. The sheriffs were retained, and they were similar to the vicomtes uh, or vicomtes of Normandy. And then we have um, a few Englishmen remain sheriffs, but most of these people are Normans. And what they were were the king's men, just as the vicomtes were in in Normandy. They were the king's men who reported to the king, and they were responsible for the collection of royal revenue, executing royal justice, and controlling the local shire and the hundred courts. And they also kept the castles. And remember how many castles were built all over England. And here are the shires. Um, it's safe to say that there are several castles in every shire. Maybe I'll let you look at that a moment, uh, the map of the shires. Now we need our clip. Okay. So that we can see all of the different uh, shires that there were in England. And later on a map, I think I have all the castles located. The stallers were replaced by court officers with Norman names, and um, the stallers were essentially they were they were household officers under the Anglo-Saxon kings. And now we have the Norman household officers, and they originally had these names that would be like the steward, the butler, the people who serve the king's meals and who keep the stables and who who take care of the um, uh, the bedchamber and so on. And these are the people that became the, the Anglo-Norman administration. And notice how many chancellors there are because the chancery became very, very important with the issuance of writs and charters, written documents of all kinds. Um, uh, so we have lots of, uh, of chancellors who are in charge of the carrying out of the, um, uh, of the of the the writing of documents because this is a a written culture now we're we're seeing a transition here from an oral to a written culture and really that happened in Normandy before they got here but it accelerated uh, very greatly when they got to England and uh, I think I have some charters to show you okay Henry Camerarius was the treasurer and this is something new we didn't see a treasurer in England before the uh, before the Norman conquest. So, so someone in charge of the treasure is, is something that's new that happened. Uh, we also see administrative innovations, uh, justiciars who function like viceroys. And there's nothing like justiciars in the Anglo-Saxon um, in the Anglo-Saxon system, you never have a, a kind of viceroy who rules for the king when the king is out of the country. And that's because the English kings didn't go out of the country. But because William the Conqueror was a Norman king, he would leave the country and he would go to Normandy. And he'd be gone in Normandy for extended times, a year or more sometimes. And so somebody had to be in charge. And various different people would. There wasn't a formal office until the time of Henry I. And Henry I was the first to make it a formal Formal office, but the Queen and the Archbishop of Canterbury and sometimes the Earl of Kent would take over for the King while he was gone, or sometimes they would all work together when the King was gone. And the Chancery issued the writs and charters, and we also talked about the forests. Uh, and and I mentioned to you uh, Dolly Wilson, my um, graduate student, who. Um, uh, has written her master's thesis on uh, the environment, the medieval environment. 
and managing the environment done by the medieval lords. We also see uh, in England, the rise of a new aristocracy. Many of the Anglo-Saxons fled to Hungary, and we can see that happening in Doomsday Book, because remember I talked about Doomsday Book, where you have a snapshot of what happened in 1066, and then a snapshot of England in 1087. So you could see the old English aristocracy as landholders, and then you could see the new Norman, uh, Norman aristocracy that had replaced them. There were a lot of marriages between Norman between Normans and English women, but and there were also marriage alliances between families. There were also uh, uh, marriages. There weren't as many between English uh, English men and. Uh, Norman women, and there's one very famous one. It's a marriage between Earl Waltheof, who was uh, a leftover from the Anglo-Saxon era, and he was an earl in the north, and uh, um, William the Conqueror married his niece, Judith of Flanders, to him. And so uh, she wasn't very happy <laughs> because he ended up being accused of uh, committing treason in one of the rebellions, the rebellion of the earls in the north. And although he swore he didn't rebel, his wife actually accused him of rebelling. And so then he, um, he ended up being executed. And this, this is a very famous incident and something that some research needs to be done about because, uh, I don't think I told you this last week, but um, it, it shows how difficult it was for the Normans to figure out how to administer the laws right at first because um, you had groups who had committed treason and some of them were Norman and some of them were Anglo-Saxon. So what William the Conqueror said was the Normans would be tried by Norman laws and the Anglo-Saxons would be tried by Anglo-Saxon laws. Okay, The Anglo-Saxon laws said that, execu that execution is the punishment for treason. The Norman laws say exile is the punishment for treason. And so the Normans who committed treason, who rebelled against the king, were sent into exile. The Anglo-Saxons were executed. And Earl Waltheof, because he claimed to be innocent, and his wife Judith was the one who, who actually, her testimony was the one that, that um, uh, condemned him to death. And so when he had his head chopped off, uh, he... Uh, he was saying the Lord's Prayer, and the rolling head repeated the rest of the prayer. And so then a bunch of monks and nuns in England wanted to declare him a saint. And so William the Conqueror and, and later, and Lanfranc had to jump all over them and say, no, we will not have, we will not have an Anglo-Saxon saint um, uh, uh, coming out or resulting from a Norman execution of an Englishman. And so they really trounced on those, those um, those attempts by some of the monks and nuns, especially some nuns were trying to do that, to the nuns of, of Romsey were trying to uh, make Earl Waltheof a saint. And I mean, you can see why the Normans had to clamp down on that, because he would be a rallying point for, for rebellion if you had a saint like that. Yeah, question. How come um, <coughs> when the the rebellions that occurred under Edward the Confessor and those, you know, people that were exiled, how come they weren't executed if in Anglo-Saxon law they were, that was the punishment for treason? That's a really, that's a really interesting uh, question. Um, it's either because they were not directly accused of treason, they were accused of some lesser crime and then sent into exile, or it's because uh, we're not getting the proper version here. Uh, the person who reported that story is Orderic Vitalis, and even though Orderic Vitalis, remember he was the son of an English mother and a Norman father, uh, he might not have the he might not have the laws correct in his mind. He might not really know the laws correctly. Uh, but that's what he reported. He may be lying. Okay, a lot of these chroniclers lie, and they lie because what they're writing is propaganda. And so he, if William executed the Englishman, well, he's going to say it because it, that's because English law said that Englishmen are supposed to be executed. That might not be true. He may be protecting the reputation of William the Conqueror. 
and that's why you have to read like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and see what it says. Yeah. If William the Conqueror or his descendants execute Normans for treason, then they offend the relatives of those who are executed both in England and in Normandy, and those people have power and may generate a new rebellion, whereas the Anglo-Saxons might also generate a new rebellion, but they do not have the kind of power that the Normans had to challenge the king. So it was more mm. of a case of real politic. It is real politic, and I'm glad you saw that about the Normans because they're very good at practicing real politic, and they're, they're very Viking in that way. I mean, that's a Viking thing to do, uh, to um, bend the laws according to the requirements of the situation, and, and this is real politic. Um, and, and it's not clear, but it's also true that at that very moment, right after the conquest, that the Normans may not have known what the Anglo-Saxon law were and were guessing at them. And that's also a possibility because it's only later that they compiled the law codes and they tried to figure out what are the laws of England that we have to follow. And as I read the sources, it was when Lanfranc came in 1070 that you have this enormous digging into the past to see what the customs of England are. And that's when it happens. It happens under Lanfranc. And one author, Helen Cam, has argued that Lanfranc is the founder of English law <laughs> because he did that. Yeah. So it's a Beck contribution, this development of legal institution or the jurisprudence. I've argued that in some of my books and articles, especially one that's in press right now that's going to come out. I've been, I've been sort of working on I've been asserting that, gently nudging it for years. I haven't done a major article, but Lanfranc was a lawyer. Remember that he was a lawyer who came from Pavia. He was trained in civil law and not in church law. And so he was acting very much as a civil lawyer in Normandy. And, and so, yeah. But when a historian like uh, Oderwick writes, is he aware of his reporting that could be used in some legal fashion? Um, for Orderick specifically, the answer is no. Well, know? yes and no. Wait a minute. <laughs> I have to think about that question. Okay, when we go to Orderick Vitalis, there's only one manuscript and it's the autograph manuscript. So there was never a copy made of his, of his work. We're pretty sure that's the only copy there is. Although, we know that some other writers like uh, perhaps William of Malmesbury had read Orderic Vitalis. And Orderic corresponded with Henry of Huntington and William of Malmesbury and um, there's another guy he corresponded with in England. Other historians, so they exchanged historical information. Um, Eadmer of Canterbury and the monks of Beck wrote their works very, very specifically to be used as, as uh, legal texts. And when you, and I've, I've, really, I've really done a lot of work on this. When you go in and read, I didn't bring my copy today of, uh, of the, the Lives of the Abbots of Beck, uh, but if you look at the introduction, the prologue, it's called the prologue to each of those, they say, I am writing this in order to, um, I'm loosely paraphrasing, but I'm writing this in order to show you how a good person ought to live and the right path that you should follow. And when he Admer, and we'll come to this later, he Admer wrote his Historia Novarum and his Vita Anselmi, and, and he makes it very clear that it's a legal document that shows the pattern that every Archbishop of Canterbury ought to follow. And he starts out by telling about um, the Archbishops of Canterbury beginning with St. Dunstan and St. Oswald and then he goes through the English models that he sees as living the perfect Episcopal life. And then he shows how Lanfranc lives that life with uh, William the Conqueror and then he shows uh, how Anselm 
had to bring that about in his own reign against great odds and against great um, resistance to bring that ideal pattern into being. And he says, these are the precedents that you should follow in this kind of a situation. And he says it really clearly. And, and it looks like he's writing a, a legal document to me. Uh, now, uh, not everybody agrees with me, but that's how I'm interpreting it. Um, and remember, well, let, let's, let's kind of get on to Lanfranc here. Here is one of the charters of William the Conqueror. And uh, I've actually brought, have I brought this book of charters? No, I haven't brought the book of charters. Okay, I'll show you some charters. I'll bring the book of charters next week. I have a book of facsimiles of these charters, and this is one of William's charters with his seal on it. And um, there's only one in this book by William the Conqueror, but there are um, lots and lots of them by William Rufus and Henry I. So, so documents are proliferating. Okay. And so let's just skip that. Repeated invasions from challengers. You can get that um, off, the, off the email, off the um, website. And the reform of the church. And I went through last time the Norman background that up to the 1050s, the Norman church was only mildly reformed and that the Abbey of Beck was really the engine of reform in Normandy. I told you the story of Erlewan and his, con and his conversion and he w involves his mother in the new abbey. Um, and, and that's kind of important because uh, later women come to the Abbey of Beck and, and um, there's a big dispute about whether women should be in monasteries or not. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, we know that in the library of Beck, there was a copy of Bede. And in the, Bede's ecclesiastical history, there are, there are stories and descriptions of what are called double monasteries where there are monasteries for both men and women side by side, or they might have even been mixed up. And, and clearly, Lanfranc and Anselm had been reading this, and especially Anselm, he um, invited what he called the mothers of Beck. He, he invited the wives of some of the men who became monks of Beck into the Abbey of Beck to live there, and he called them the mothers of Beck. And they lived there right alongside the monks. And, his, uh, and Erlewan's own mother helped in the foundation of Beck. And, and of course, one of, the th one of the reasons he did this, it's clearly the veneration of the Virgin Mary. And Beck was dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And he's making mothers very much um, holy and married women who are mothers. And in fact, I've written a whole book about that. I don't know if sh I've showed you this before. I don't think I have. St. Anselm and the Handmaidens of God. And here's our picture of, of Emma, who is a mother. <laughs> Not a very good one, but <laughs> Anselm takes the uh, the story of women and, and, and he really um, and, and he really extols women as the ideal women are married women and mothers. Like the Virgin. Which she she was married, she was a mother. That was her, her great function and role in life. And he glorifies women. He thinks women are better than men. He thinks women train their husbands as well as their children. And, and he's, he's seeing every woman as a kind of miniature Virgin Mary. I mean, he's seeing, he's seeing these women as very central in society. Um, so we see the glimmer of this in the earliest story of Erlewin and involving his mother at Beck, this, this elevation of women. When Lanfranc came to Beck, he was called the Lantern of Learning in the 1040s, and actually Orderic said, that there were no learned people at all in Normandy before Lanfranc came, and he was the light of learning. This is not strictly true, and if you read David Bates' book, Normandy Before 1066, you can see that there are learned men, and uh, to some degree, in um, Fay Comp, in San Juan Drill, in uh, Jumiege, which were all reformed in, in 1002 by William of Dijon. Uh, but, but Lanfranc founds the first big school at Beck, and he was a civil lawyer from Pavia, and, uh, and it's, it's, I mean, I can't go through the whole Vita Erlewani and the, and the story, but um, he becomes pretty much uh, Erlewani's equal, and he probably brought the Benedictine rule, and, and 
The, the life says that they contended one with another, each one, each one respecting the other as an equal, but each one trying to be the inferior to the other. I mean, they vied with each other as to who would be sub, subject himself to the other, which suggests that they had a kind of role of equality. And Lanfranc immediately became prior and he opened a school and it was a huge success. Students came from everywhere and we have lists of some of the names and, and they're, they're churchmen. There are monks that come from all over Italy and Flanders and Germany and Gascony and, and, uh, and from all over uh, the continent. People come to Lanfranc school. Nobody from England comes at first. <laughs> and, and he also says that, that duques come Duques, sons of Duques, and Duque, the word Duques means military leader. And so this, this implies laymen. Who were the sons of these laymen? And I argued in an article that, um, that we could find out who the sons of Duques were if we could go to the earliest grants made to, ben, to Beck, you know, the charters that exist that, that say who gave land to Beck, and it's probably the sons of those families who went to Beck. And then I listed them all, and lo and behold, they turned out to be the people who were the most important people in William the Conqueror's administration when they went to England. So they might have been educated, and they might have been educated at Beck, which is really pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, Ross, did you have a question? Is there any information available about where Lanfranc may have been exposed to the rule of Benedict? To the Benedictine rule? Um, no. Uh, it's not even certain that Lanfranc introduced the Benedictine rule, but if you read the life of Erlewam very, very carefully, you see that um, Erlewan was ruling Beck by a different old-fashioned rule uh, that was very, very strict. And it was so strict that his monks who lived there, and there weren't very many, but they were trying to escape, and they were so desperate to escape that they escaped through the privy. And of course, uh, the life of Erlewan says, well, the devil made him do it, it made him try to escape from Beck. But it was clear it's because Erlewan was ruling them with such a strict rule. And Erlewan was trying to convert some of the local, uh, the local laymen to come and, and, you know, the knights and the miles to come and be monks of Beck. And they just laughed at him and said, you know, uh, that's insane. I'm not going to do that. And, and Clearly, you can see it's because his rule was so strict that, that nobody would want to live that way. So he, he was making mistakes, and he was learning through experience how to run that abbey. And when Lanfranc came, he, he applied a proper rule. And so I think Lanfranc brought the rule of St. Benedict. Now, if Lanfranc is true to form, and he's a lawyer, the first thing he would try to do is find out what the rules are. And where would he find the rules? Well, the best uh, <coughs> monasteries are ruled by the rule of St. Benedict. And since Erlewa was so inexperienced in what he did, that it might have taken Lanfranc to introduce that rule. And so, again, this is by deduction. We don't have anybody saying Lanfranc brought the rule of St. Benedict. And so this is my guess that he brought it. And this is how history is written of this time. <laughs> and you can do it too. You can read your primary sources and you can say, well, this is what I see happening here. <laughs> so um, and that's, what you're that's what historians do. Um, and so all these students come and then Beck gets very, very rich enormously rich and uh, so one student who comes to Beck is the future Pope Alexander II who he was Anselm of Baggio he was from Italy he came from Italy to study at Beck and it makes you wonder why are all these Italians coming to study at Beck and these Germans well they are Lanfranc spent a whole year with Pope Leo the Ninth. Remember, he spent the whole year of I think it was 1051 at Leo the Ninth's court, 1050 to 1051, and so these must have been people who were associated with the papal court. And Leo the Ninth was a German, and of course the papacy though is centered in Rome, so all of these people 
have something to do with the reform going on in the Roman Church. And so people who are in the church already, who were monks, are studying at Beck, and also laymen are studying at Beck. So uh, it, it's just becoming a, a, an enormous school for the rest of, of Europe. And here is Mont Saint-Michel, which is one of the older monasteries of Normandy. And as I mentioned before, Lanfranc, I thought, began to bring the Benedictine rule, and he starts to form priories um, and incorporate other churches. A priory, do you all know what a priory is? A priory is a is a daughter church, a daughter house, okay. If you have, uh, Beck would have been the mother house, and then these priories of Cormy, uh, Preo, Lese, uh, and, and there are a bunch of other ones, uh, they are daughter houses to Beck, and there's a, they're ruled by a prior, and they're ruled by the same rules as Beck, and they report to the abbot of Beck. And there's this wonderful story in the life of Lanfranc that, that um, when the, everything started out and he had to do really hands-on things to set up these priories and he had to do circuits and go around and visit them all. And he would, uh, one time he was going and, and uh, he met somebody along the road and said, what is that crazy sack you're, you're, you're holding and, and why is it wiggling around so much and making so much noise? And he said, well, I'm bringing a cat to kill all the mice who are eating the grain at the Abbey of Lesse. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's the level at which he had to work at first, uh, uh, of the really ground level from, from the ground up. And somehow in the 1050s, he became the right-hand man of William the Conqueror, and nobody really knows why. Nobody knows how he managed to do that, how he got William to trust him and adopt him as his right-hand man. But, uh, but Orderick says, and so do the lives of Beck, say that Duke William placed Lanfranc as on a watchtower over the churches of all of Normandy, and we see little glimmers of that in Orderick Vitalis, where Lanfranc is going around and replacing people who he regards as um, old-fashioned and not up-to-date and not up to the standards of the Reformed Papacy. One of these people is Archbishop Moguer, who uh, was Archbishop of Rouen. I believe he was also a count in one of the counties as well. And he was the brother of William the Conqueror, the half-brother. And so Lanfranc deposed him and installed Morilius, who was a monk from northern Italy who had, been, who had come to Fécamp, where he was, where he was uh, working and teaching. Yeah. With all the hoop to do about the deposition of the Archbishop of Canterbury by Stegan, how in the why, and supposedly that can't be done, mm -hmm. then how in the wide world can they depose this Archbishop? They can do it by legal, by the way that lawyers do it. <laughs> you, you interpret each, each, um, each case. And what they can argue is that Moguer was never rightfully archbishop. I'm guessing this is what the argument was that Lanfranc made, although it's not made clear in the sources, that Moguer was somehow not the rightful archbishop. And so, therefore, he had never been archbishop. Therefore, he should be replaced. Yeah. It seems like oftentimes uh, this kind of revisionism is used by changing the past and saying that somebody was never a certain way. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But this is a legal trick at court. And, and one of the interesting things about the life of Erlewan, which is the probably the oldest, um, uh, the most contemporary source in Normandy, uh, closest to the events that happened, are the accounts of trials that are in there. And if you read them, I mean, they're real trials. There's one account of a trial where um, Erlewan is put on trial because he has, he has denied his um, homage and fealty to his lord, uh, who would have been uh, Count Gil uh, Gilbert of uh, Brionne. And um, it, it's almost a word-by-word -word account of the trial where uh, Erlewan argues uh, his right to withdraw from the court and, and become a monk. And not only that, but he uh, first Gilbert of Brion um, 
confiscates his land and then uh, Erlewan talks him into giving it back to him by giving it to God for his monastery. And, and so, I mean, these guys are really skilled lawyers. And, and so you see these legal lawsuits and cases everywhere in, in the literature from Beck and later from England as well. Yeah. I'm wondering if the friendship between uh, William and Len Frank uh, is because some of the expansion of Beck properties that William may have assisted in by taking away from the wayward lords that were creating so much trouble. There's no evidence of that, but William gave a lot of lands to Beck. There's no evidence he took them away from others, but he gave a lot of his own lands to Beck. And, um, and so that makes me wonder if, if I wonder if uh, his sons might have been educated at Beck. Uh, but there's no evidence uh, uh, that actually states that. And so we, don't, we know that uh, Henry was educated. We don't know that William Rufus and Robert Curthose were educated. But we know Henry was. Yeah, but Henry was educated in England, not at Beck. We know he was educated in England. Well, um, the liberties and customs of Beck are essentially freedom from all lay and Episcopal authority, that the Church of Beck is to be totally independent from any lay overlords and, and any Episcopal overlords. So what the people at Beck are declaring themselves is free from the feudal system in that they're not vassals of the Duke. And they're also free from the system of local obedience to the local bishop. And they don't necessarily say that they're obedient to the pope. They claim just complete independence. And that's what the Abbey of Cluny is, except the Abbey of Cluny has to uh, obey the pope. But here, they're, they're, the pope isn't mentioned. Um, what they're claiming is they're a law unto themselves, that they, they only have to do what they want to do. And here is the Abbey of Lassay, which was the first Beck Priory. And I, I imagine that Beck must have looked something like this. This is a, a clear Norman Romanesque church with a, with a tower over the crossing. This is the... Um, east end. The doorway is not in the west end. It's on the side of the church and you see that in a lot of English churches. The, the doorway to go in is right over here, slightly off the picture. And there is the interior which is very like Beck, a very plain and austere um, really not too much decorated kind of, of church on the inside and, and rounded and very heavy uh, Romanesque um, um, columns, three-story elevation like this. Uh, the groin groined vault is later. It would have had a wooden ceiling originally. And then the groined vault comes later. In 1063, Lanfranc became abbot of Caen, and he was uh, teaching by example, as my student Priscilla Watkins has argued. Um, and what he did was literally build the city of Caen from, from practically nothing to a, the second major city in Normandy. And Lanfranc did this by constructing or having the monks construct canals and, and connect the, the two rivers that uh, meet in Caen with canals canals and, and waterways and building water mills and bringing artisans and craftsmen and manufacturers and seeing to the granting of land throughout the city. And so this is really interesting. Uh, Anselm came to Beck in about 1059 and so Anselm and Lanfranc were only together at Beck for maybe about four or five years. Uh, but nevertheless, Lanfranc recognized Anselm's genius immediately. Anselm himself was a student from Aosta in Italy, which is it's really on the French border, the area of Savoy. And Lanfranc made him prior almost immediately, and he was the one who continued the school of Beck, which now became filled with monastic students. And as far as I can tell from reading the literature, Erlewan at that point became a figurehead. And uh, they let him relax and enjoy his life. And Anselm ran everything, is what it looks to me like. And I mentioned the mothers of Beck already. Uh, Anselm is famous for writing his theology, his prayers, and meditation. 
uh, but he was he was truly a Renaissance man who could do anything and, and as abbot he had a lot of work to do running the abbey. He became abbot in 1079 to 80 and he continued building daughter houses of Beck. This is Saint Etienne Caen, uh, which was the great abbey that um, uh, Lanfranc built at the city of Caen and built the city around it. And here, are, here is the Virgin Mary and some of the, uh, um, in, in Anglo-Norman literature, Anglo-Norman artwork, it's dedicated to the Virgin. Lanfranc was Archbishop of Canterbury in 1070 when Stigand was deposed. Interestingly, earlier Lanfranc had been elected Archbishop of Rouen and he refused that office. He refused to take it and he found another monk, John uh, Abbot of Evranches, or was he Bishop or Abbot of Evranches? I think it was Bishop of Evranches. And um, Lanfranc literally went to Rome in order to get John appointed Archbishop of Rouen because Lanfranc did not want to be Archbishop of Rouen. But he did want to be Archbishop of Canterbury. He tried to decline the office, but his student, Pope Alexander II, ordered him to be Archbishop of Canterbury. And this, uh, one of my fellow students from Santa Barbara has argued, was a a kind of pious ritual that monks are supposed to go through, that all monks are supposed to refuse high office because a person who seeks high office is unworthy. It's only if you don't seek it and, and the office finds you that you are really worthy. So here we have the office finding Lanfranc, but, but um, I think Lanfranc did want to be Archbishop of Canterbury and uh, not that he wasn't a holy man, but he saw his mission as reforming the English church and he certainly did that. And, and we said last time the first thing he did was, um, was make an inquest of all English customs through witnesses with oral history, through bead and documents and declared himself the primate of all Britain and tried to gain obedience from Scotland, Ireland, and the Orkneys. He was welcomed by um, uh, Pope Alexander II as magister, which means teacher, and primate of all Britain, and also as pope of another world. And so he's considering, they're considering the British Isles as another world from the continent. Uh, he ran into problems because uh, Thomas uh, of Bayou was appointed Archbishop of York and immediately as a student of Beck, Thomas of Bayou researched all the records about York and lo and behold he discovered that there, on different legal points he could argue that he was equal to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so we had this huge lawsuit where both of them go to court and both of them are arguing their legal cases for the rights of their bishop. Their archbishoprics. Lanfranc won um, largely because he had more materials at hand and also Alexander, Pope Alexander was his student and agreed with him and, and referred the case back to William. And so then Lanfranc uh, appointed all this proof or, or produced all this proof. Thomas produced his evidence and Lanfranc won because Thomas didn't really have a whole lot of evidence. Um, the monasteries were reformed and Lanfranc wrote the monastic constitution and began to bring Beck and Com monks to fill abbatial vacancies. And so, um, and so most of the, uh, um, by the, by the time the Norman period is over in um, 1130, well, 1154, all, all the monks, uh, all the abbeys in England are ruled by Normans from Beck and Com. Yeah, comment. I had a question about the Lanfranc Thomas debate. That that was actually one of the questions that we had for yeah. the term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was curious. Lanfranc cites custom as his defense for his answer. Yeah. Why why are they so apt to trust custom instead of developing uh, a, an equitable system? It, it seems like they cast aside an equitable system in order to cleave to, to custom. Is there a reason for that? Because in that, in that day, custom was law. That how, how do you determine what the law is? You look at the pattern of the past. You look at the history of the past. 
and you look at past precedents. And that's how you figure out. Uh, can you think of any reason why they're thinking in this way? Why would the record of the past and the, uh, the, um, the things that were done in the past be regarded as some kind of a law that they had to follow in the present and in the future? Yeah, but that's just it. See, I understand why they're doing it. And I understand why Land Frank's doing it. Uh -huh. but what I'm saying is I don't understand why they're forced to use it. Yeah, it's it sounds like a good basis, but it seems to me that if you want a rational basis for how you're going to distribute power, you would use something better than custom. I mean, you're not bound by history. They just decide to use that instead of thinking of, oh, but thinking they of a are. new model. They think they're bound by history. Why would they think they're bound by history? Anybody, anybody have any idea? Why? Yeah. I mean, the past is created by the religious leaders, like St. Augustine is seen to be very important. In uh, 597, he comes to Britain and is seen to be a very auspicious and almost divinely guided uh, event. Exactly. He's divinely guided. Okay, if you, if you believe that God guides history and God reconstructs history and God guides events, then you have to see, and God never does anything wrong, <laughs> then the history, then history becomes sacred. It becomes sacred and it becomes law and the pattern of the past is what you have to follow. It's a, it's a, it, it's a model. Uh, and remember when I was talking about the lives of the abbots of Beck? When, um, when um, they were all, all the authors were writing and saying, here is the pattern you're supposed to follow and this, this life will show you the right path for the way you ought to live your life. Well, that's how they're regarding history. It, it's like the microcosm is the life of one man or one abbot. The macrocosm is the, the history of the entire English church. And that's why Bede is being used as a legal text. And, and this has all kinds of implications that are sort of mind-blowing because if this is true, then what Anselm and Lanfranc had to do was to like reenact the past and they needed to convert England on the pattern of St. Augustine, the first missionary to England to sort of act it out and reenact re that um, conversion of England. And that's what they think they're doing. I, I, I think it's pretty mind-blowing, but that's what they think they're doing, yeah? And I think that's why they, they seem to be so cognizant of the kinds of testimonials they create on important occasions like Lanfranc and uh, uh, the York, uh, what's his name? Thomas of Thomas's York. Thomas's yeah. uh, uh -huh. interaction. I mean, there's very careful wording and and thinking about what, sh what, how to say these things. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. And did you have a comment? Yeah. Yes, I did. I, it, th this to me begs the question, where does Lanfranc draw the line? Because when he came to Beck, he was more than willing to disregard Beck's history and bring a new rule. But now here at Canterbury, he wants to keep the old it seems to me, I hate to be simple, but that he's doing yeah. what's best for him. He brings the new rule to Beck because it, it's better for him, and he argues Canterbury is superior because it's, again, best for him. Um, I think we can't say that without um, examining more about what Lanfranc did. Margaret Gibson wrote a, a book about Lanfranc called Lanfranc of Beck, and um, uh, and the title was very telling because what she did in that book was examine all his writings at Beck and she found him to be very, very old fashioned. That he belonged to the kind of Carolingian school where he didn't use reason or he didn't use logic to figure things out. What he did was to use the, um, uh, the laws of the Bible or the laws of the tracts of the fathers. And so he was doing the same thing like that in his theological tracts at Beck. And he was involved in a major lawsuit uh, involved with Berengar of Tours, who was one of his students. And Berengar was accused of heresy because Berengar wrote a tract that argued that in the Mass, at the moment when you have the transubstantiation of the bread and the wine into the actual body and blood of Christ, 
that that didn't really happen because logically it can't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And, and that was declared heresy. And so Lanfranc was the one who wrote the papal, the official papal stance on that. And what he did, he didn't argue by means of reason, but instead he had a list of statements by the church fathers like St. Augustine and Oregon and the Bible and St. Paul and, and everybody who had written in the past about the issue. And that was his proof. It was a historical proof of what people had said in the past. These, their minds worked differently, at least in Lanfranc's mind. But Anselm's mind is different because Anselm is the first one to break that pattern and use reason. Yeah, Jason, did you have a comment? Yeah, getting back to the uh, York and Canterbury controversy, um, that all being true about uh, seeing the past as divinely guided, I would think that they would go with Thomas's argument because if he has the older evidence and he has the evidence that was divinely guided from the Augustan mission uh, when he was sent by Gregory, why would they go against Thomas then? Okay, they would go against Thomas and that's a really good point because if you read Bede carefully, you see that um, what Bede is saying is that it's a letter from Pope Gregory the Great is what is the evidence in Bede and it's quoted in Bede and what it says is there shall be two bishops in England. He, these are his instructions to St. Augustine. There shall be two bishops in England, archbishops. One shall be at York and one shall be at London. Uh, you are in Canterbury, but you are to move your bishopric to London um, as soon as you're able. And each of you, York and London, will have uh, 12 suffragan bishops under you, and you will be equal. And the one who, who dies first, is, uh, his successor is crowned by the other, and there are two equals who, who operate as equals. Okay, the argument is that Lanfranc makes is, I'm not, the, I'm not the Archbishop of London. I'm still the Archbishop of Canterbury, so therefore I'm your superior. I mean, so he just bypasses and trashes Thomas's argument. It seems like they, they kind of missed the intent, though, that the two should be separate. He got by it. But Lanfranc's a lawyer. <laughs> and lawyers don't, the lawyers don't interpret the other person's case in, in the other person's favor. I mean, lawyers argue their own cases. <laughs> And that's the whole point. I mean, when you examine the evidence, you say, hey, wait a minute, Thomas really does have a case. Um, and, and he does, in a way. But then so does Lanfranc, because truly uh, there is a Bishop of London, but the Archbishop of Canterbury never transferred the see of the Archbishopric to London, and it's still at Canterbury. And so in that case, uh, in that case, what Gregory said is inoperative, it's sort of trumped by usage that the church has been ruled by the Archbishop of Canterbury all those many centuries. And, and so this is essentially the argument he's making. So, yeah. I think tradition is important, but people like Len Frank uh, do a certain amount of incremental change to these. They seem to possess cert certain kind of authority. Otherwise, we would never have movement and evolution within the church if people keep going back to the very early rulings. Well, you're right, and Lanfranc did introduce changes, and one of the things he did was to replace <laughs> all the abbots of the churches with, uh, with Beck monks, and Beck and Calm monks, and so, and of course there were a lot of rebellions, as we said last week, among the Englishmen for having these, these foreigners ruling over them. Um, and he also um, sort of regularized the bishoprics of England according to a legal just sense. Pardon? Pardon? We've got some interference here. We've got some interference here. <laughs> Feedback. All right. Now we're okay. Okay, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, oh yes, um, he regularized some bishoprics because 
according to the law uh, of the uh, uh, of the gospels or it's not the gospels it's the um, it's the custom of the church that a bishopric is always supposed to be in a city and he found in England that there were three bishoprics that were out in the countryside in country uh, churches that were not in cities and so he reorganized those bishoprics and relocated them in real cities because that's the way they were supposed to be according to the law and the Pope ratified it. Alexander II, you know, rubber stamped everything he did. And and so he was he was reforming the Church of England. He was regularizing and make it be what it wanted to be. There were some laws that Lanfranc was referring to, and these were the laws of the um, the councils of Toledo. And there were there were a number of councils, up to ten councils of Toledo that were held in Spain uh, that legislated for the church, and he used those as laws that he would that he would appeal to when he for guidance for himself when he wanted to see what needed to be done to the Church of England and and this is in in an environment in which a lot of people around Europe are really interested in um, researching law codes and finding out what the laws of the church are and writing them down in a code and so some people in Germany are doing that pro that at the very same time and Lanfranc was doing it too by digging up the councils of Toledo and um, uh, uh, Pseudo Dionysius, which uh, uh, was a law code that came from, uh, it was an anonymous law code that came from early Christian times. And so he was following these law codes that he found. And we also see um, the recovery of lands. And uh, I mentioned Rochester as the chief lieutenant. The, the Church of Rochester was just a little ways from England. and. Um, uh, Gundolf uh, of Rochester was a Beck monk who became the um, the Bishop of Rochester and Gundolf was doing exactly the same kind of historical research that Lanfranc was doing and I brought for you today a book to look at called the Textus Rofensis and I have to show you this this book was originally owned by David Douglas who has now died it's from his library and I'm very honored to have been able to to buy it. And uh, these, I don't know whose notes these are. I don't think they're David Douglas's. But this is the Textus Rofensis. And this is um, 1720. This is a 1720 edition of it. So it's a really wonderful, wonderful book. And it's, um, it, what it has is, uh, uh, the ancient professions of uh, the bishops and formulas of the English church about canonical obedience um, uh, to the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and uh, a dissertation and it's a collection that was made of various texts that related to the Church of Rochester. And what it is, is a legal investigation into the past, okay? This is kind of an introduction, all right? Written in Latin, and this is a 17th century introduction. Errata. Okay, here is it starts. Textus Refensis, Chapter 1. All right, this is an Anglo-Saxon document. It's written in Anglo-Saxon. It is a, it is a, um, it is all the charters by which they are proving that they own various lands that belong to the church. And so they collected Anglo-Saxon charters. And here, here is this one. Uh, okay, it's a long one, a long charter. Okay, this is Anglo-Saxon. And then as you go along, you get into Latin charters. Okay, here are the laws of King Alfred. Uh, and they're written in Latin. Uh, uh, according to William the Lombard. Okay, that's interesting. Here are the, the laws of King Edward. They've collected the laws of King Edmund. This is an earlier Edward. I think this is Edward the Elder. Here are the laws of Alfred the King. Okay, and they're in Anglo-Saxon. All right. This is an exorcism. Here is an exorcism by water. That's chapter 20. 
a formula for exorcism. Okay, uh, a reading from the book of Leviticus. Okay, another from the book of Ephesus. This would have been a letter from Ephesus. Okay. This looks like a of Ephesus. Okay, it's a lock, it's a case, a law case. Here's a prayer and here's a benediction. Okay, and it's all kinds of documents. Later on there are land grants. Um, okay, this is the account of a trial. Okay, whether um, it beginnings the uh, geratio, the judgment of the by the sword. Oh, this is a trial by sword, where they carry out the judgment by the sword. They they actually have to fight a battle, and the loser, uh, God judges the loser at fault, and the winner wins the case. Okay, so this is a judgment by sword, um, and this is a another judgment by sword and so they're recounting all these trials but you can see in the collection of these documents the legal mindset that these students of Beck have and this is what is going on in this Textus Refensus. We can skip to the back where there's more Latin. Okay. Um, Okay, here is, is a document by Ernulf, Bishop of Rochester. He was the Bishop of Rochester before Gundolf. It's a charter from Ernulf to all the men of Buckingham, both French and English, salutem. And you see how it, how it echoes how William the Conqueror would write his <coughs> charter. That's exactly how William the Conqueror would address his charter to all his faithful men, French and English. Know that I have conceded to the Church of St. Andrew of Rochester for the illumination of that church and the church, the church of Ed Edenham and the lands and, um, and um, taxes of all of them of, from the same church and so that they w will hold it, uh, so that they may hold it. Um, and will be able to hold it in the future with all the th uh, with all its appurtenances, and that's a standard um, standard formula that you make with a land grant. So here they've collected in the Textus Rofensis every single land grant that they had, because these are legal documents that preserve and protect their land. So you can see the legal studies that are being done by monks of Beck, both Ernolf and um, and uh, uh, Gundolf were monks of Beck. And so here you see um, someone has underlined this. It wasn't me. <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, I write in modern books, not old ones. But here is the witness list, and the witness lists of them, and they're very interesting to see who has done it. So Osborne, son of Osmond. This would have been Os Osborne, um, the, um, who was. Uh, uh, one of the chief officers of William the Conqueror. This is that Osborne, son of Osborne, and many from our family and others. Okay, so these are the witness lists. And, and so this is a collection, a, a book of charters. And here is the catalog of the library that lists all the books that are in the library uh, uh, there. And they haven't printed it all, but in the original manuscript it would be, it would be here. Um, Okay, this, these are more charters, and now they're all Latin. And here we have, here we have a picture of, uh, okay, this is a modern dwelling house, the Abbey Mill, and some remains of the old bridge. This is the 17th century, and this is what would have been at Rochester in the 17th century. So I thought I'd bring that for, for you to see the Beck methodology of legal research <laughs> that, uh, that was taking uh, that. And, and this, is the, this is the system that was imported into England. And they applied it not only to the legal documents that recorded their land grants and the law codes that they collected, but also to the writing of saints' lives. And there's a very extraordinary collection of saints' lives made by Goscalin of San Bertan 
And uh, Sam Bertin was actually in, um, in Flanders. And Gosquelin had been in England since before the conquest, but after the conquest, not before, but after, he traveled around to all the old monasteries of England, all the old nunneries, and he wrote all the lives of the women saints of England, who, who most of whom had been queens. And he rewrote their lives uh, again in a new collection. These aren't well translated into English. They're hard to get hold of. But um, there, there was a book written about them by Susan uh, Ridyard, who argued that they're Norman versions that are to serve as models for the conquered people, that, they, that these saints' lives were completely rewritten by the Normans for their own political pur purposes, which were to serve as models for the English people to follow. And this is a very Beck thing to do. <laughs> Even though Gosquelin was not a monk of Beck, and so we have William and, and um, uh, Lanfranc working together on similar purposes. Well, let's take our break now, and we'll continue when we come back. <laughs> 